Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Jess Hilarious, Charlemagne, the guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. We got the brother Russell Fletcher. Welcome, brother. Welcome. I, I appreciate you guys actually uh, uh, invite me to the show and mm -hmm. giving me the opportunity to come in. Um, it's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Happy founder, to be here this morning. Founder of Mishka Premium Vodka. Yes. And I just found a master distiller. distiller. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I am the master distiller. Master distiller of uh, Mishka Premium Vodka. The company's name is uh, This Life Forever. Mm -hmm. um, something that I've held on to for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been kind of um, kind of my thing as far as just the way of life and also just being able to make sure that I could just promote good values, mm -hmm. uh, community based. Uh, we are alcohol driven, but. Um, we make award-winning spirits, and we try to figure out the best ways to be able to give back to the community and uh, work in the community. Now, your distillery is uh, in Pennsylvania? It Allentown, is in right? Pennsylvania, yep. I was just there this weekend. Yep. Uh, Y'all got like, what, 15, 14 inches of snow when yeah, I was there yeah, DJing? Yeah, yep. it, was, it was pretty nasty. Salute to yeah. the brothers from Maine yeah. 25. So let me <laughs> ask you, how you got? How did you get into liquor? Most people uh, uh, start off either buying or selling marketing, but you actually right. learned how to make it. So I started off at amateur winemaking. And I learned how to make, uh, while I was in Staten Island, living in Staten Island, I learned how to make wine in the garage from Italians. Moonshine. <laughs> Call it what it is, Russell. You was making that moonshine. It, was, it definitely wasn't legal at the time. Uh, <laughs> but at the end of the day, uh, I did, you know, kind of home in on my craft. Um, I was finishing up my nursing degree, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to switch. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, you know what? Like, I want to make a little bit more of an impact. Mm -hmm. And um, and the only way to make impact is what? Financially impact things in order to be able to change things. Mm -hmm. So with alcohol being a multi-trillion you know trillion dollar market, it's uh, it was kind of the obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, seven years in winemaking, um, amateur, won some awards, got my license. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't actually illegal <laughs> anymore, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I was no longer selling uh, selling a product, uh, my sparkling wine, out of the back of my uh, my Mercedes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my mom helped me actually just uh, legitimize everything and get my license together. How difficult was it to get your license? Very difficult. Um, again, you know, uh, my mom just having just a bunch of uh, like city work experience, mm -hmm. and um, she was diligent on the paperwork. Uh, I was diligent on the marketing. And then, um, you know, obviously now I, I learned all the paperwork and then some. But uh, difficult process. Um, they ask a lot. You know, your partner is either the state and the federal government, but always the federal government first. And you guys kind of know how the federal government is. Mm -hmm. It You know, it could be a difficult process. And we didn't use any lawyers. Mm -hmm. so what you mean? We didn't use a lawyer to be able to put the paperwork through for us. Uh, normally you're going to you know, pay a lawyer roughly about fifty to $100,000 just to be able to put all the paperwork through in order to be able to manufacture alcohol. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's a difference, obviously, in making a brand, uh, owning a brand, and mm -hmm. then actually manufacturing the alcohol and being able to make sure that you have all the regulatory things that are in place. So, so when you used to make your own wine, you had your grapes and what you was in the tub with it? Or <laughs> what, what you was doing? Uh, right in the barrels, plastic barrels. Okay. Um, went, from, uh, went from crushing the grapes, then realizing that I could actually buy the juice already crushed, mm -hmm. uh, and then we started to scale. We were doing um, everything from uh, NFL events, a bunch of different events, but you know, it's an industry, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not a lot of us in mm -hmm. the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so the larger that I got, um, you know, the way my supplies were squeezing my, you know, my margins just a little bit, because in Pennsylvania, you don't, you know, you normally don't have a vineyard. Um, mm -hmm. It's a cold state. So, you know, you would either get your grapes or you get your juice from somewhere else and then you ferment the wine and then you would actually bring it to bottle. And uh, from my bottling side of it to my grapes and then something started to squeeze me out. And uh, my um, finishing up my last year just before I went to my nursing, like my nurse, my nursing, like preclinicals and my clinicals, um, I decided that I, I had enough and I thought that I had a good foothold just within the wine industry. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had a little bit of brand awareness and had some, you know, industry experience knowing that, you know, behind music, fashion, but also at the same time, alcohol, that's what's going to drive the party mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So I wanted to make sure that I kind of got into that mm -hmm. and uh, me surviving and having a license in, uh, in the state, in the Commonwealth uh, based on wine. Um, they weren't even doing dual distillery license. So I had one of the first three dual distillery license, dual winery and uh, distillery license in the Commonwealth. Uh, and then I started doing vodka. I met my wife, uh, my now wife, uh, who's Ukrainian. Um, and I learned how to make, uh, I learned how to make vodka in the garage from Ukrainian. So Italians wow. with the wine, 
Ukrainians with the uh, with the vodka, and um, and now I'm here. Well, congrats on uh, they say you're the most awarded black owned spirits brand in the country. That is a fact. Break that down. What, what's the, what those awards so, look like? So, um, so the oldest wine and spirits uh, competition in the world is the um, um, San Francisco World Spirits Competition. Okay. Um, we're the only black owned spirit with a double goal. Mm -hmm. um, double goal this one, gold this one, uh, multiple silvers with these. So, you know, and we just continue to get better. Uh, so, you know, you take a brand um, like something that's more famous, you know, like an Uncle Nearest. Our Uncle Nearest, they've won multiple awards. Mm -hmm. um, they are one of the top, you know, awarded whiskeys. Um, but at the same time, we've been getting awards since 2016 when I first actually dropped Misha wow. Honey. The, the awards in, in the liquor business mean anything? And the reason I ask that is, you know, I hear it all the time that this one gets an award, this this one gets an award, but it always seems like, regardless of the awards, it's brand recognition is what people buy, right? Uh, especially when you're dealing with, you know, people in the industry. They just want what's the dopest thing, right. which is sad sometimes because they could be drinking shit, right. but the ones with the awards, nobody's necessarily Nobody knows. catering right. to that. Until you get a platform like this, which mm -hmm. again, you know, I'm thankful in the, in the way because it kind of sheds light because... I, I chose not to go with uh, celebrity endorsements. Mm -hmm. We are just a real story. Uh, this is my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in this business for 15 years. Uh, we might not make you know what someone else makes, but it's similar to uh, remaining independent. I own my manufacturing. Uh, I own 94% of the company, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and from an award standpoint of it, so the San Francisco World Spirits Competition is a blind tasting. So you're not buying that. So getting a double goal is, is like getting a Grammy in the industry as far mm -hmm. as for us. So when someone says that, whether it be a sommelier or whether it be somebody at the top of the food chain who's a major buyer, mm -hmm. they want to know. And then the first thing they ask is, can I see that printed? And obviously we have those things printed. So it works um, for who we're feeding, which is the buyer. Um, but, you know, it works a little bit different, obviously, when it comes down to the recognition amongst uh, the quote unquote common people. Why not do uh, any celebrity endorsement? Because we've seen so many other people do it. You know, of course, uh, Ciroc with Diddy, you know, uh, Casamigos with George Clooney. Like, why did you say, you know, what, I don't want to go that route? Um, because, you know, when you take uh, when you take both of those situations, right? One, it worked very, very well. Billions were made, right? That's Casamigos. Well, that's, well, Casamigos on that side. Yeah. But also, as far as with, I mean, Puff, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, he, he took it to billions of dollars. Absolutely. Uh, but also, at the same time, look at the parallels of what, you know, what the situation ended up. One thing could be a car crash. The other thing could be, you know, it could be success and get out of the game. Uh, so, for us, um, I, it's kind of like a blended of a Tito's route. You got to think about it, right? Tito's owns, you know, I mean, he owns the, the vodka market, right? Mm -hmm. 25 years that they've been in business. Um, it's Tito's, period. I feel like they came out of nowhere, too. But they didn't, though. Yeah. But they, but they did, right? Mm -hmm. General public. But in the industry, we knew exactly what it was. So I started to kind of just track what we were doing and kind of just keep those parallels there. Because at the end of the day, this is generational wealth. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for a quick sell. In the company, what I actually did was I ended up taking the company public on Start Engine just to be able to give it to people that were like me who don't understand the industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tito's did 1.4 billion dollars from 22 to 23. Mm -hmm. They paid roughly about 468 million dollars in operational fees and operational wow. costs with no celebrity endorsements, nothing, mm -hmm. just quality of product yeah. and going to a domestic aspect of it. Now, one thing that does set you know companies apart is what you, what are your what's your relationship value mm -hmm. right so our relationship value is based on people who can connect us with you know folks like you guys but also at the same time who can place us with corporations uh such as Aramark such as uh the Marriott um, such as the Hilton uh these are corporate placements that mm -hmm. we have we'll be in Disney properties uh come in May wow which is huge for us. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah. I appreciate it. Now, even though that you get in these properties and you get in these restaurants and you get into these establishments, it's also people have to actually want the product yes. or not only that, the businesses have to push the product. 100%. So now how do you fight through that? So um, that goes back to the quality of the product and the reason why I made the product. Uh, used to be a big fan of Grand Marnier, right? So loved Grand Marnier for a good portion of my life. Um, and I wanted to be able to create something that kind of kind of top Grand Marnier, right? So I started working on a honey vodka. 
Now, when you take the base of our products, the products are all natural. Mm -hmm. uh, the products are gluten-free. Um, there's no added sugars. There's no added coloring into it. It's a quality product. And it's a flavor product that ends off at 80 proof, right? Normal flavor products, they normally finish up roughly about 70 proof. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've made almost a cocktail in the bottle. So instead of doing five parts in a cocktail, which is what dehydrates you, gives you that sugar rush, gives you that that taste in the back of your mouth in the morning, uh, gives you the headache, mm -hmm. uh, we've kind of taken that. Go ahead, man. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? I didn't say nothing. Come on, Charlotte. I didn't say Come nothing. On, I'm just man. like, wow. Okay. He was so, intrigued. But no, you looked in every's eyes and you was like, that taste in the Damn, back of your bro. mouth in the morning. Of course. Damn. Come on, man. Come Go ahead. Go ahead bro. That wasn't even that. <laughs> Go ahead, Russell. Go ahead, man. So, so what, we, what we did was we completed it by making sure that you can only add, you only need two parts as far as in a cocktail. Mm -hmm. So that's advantageous to a lot of these restaurants, these corporate partners, because now they're saving on the cocktail juice, right? They're saving on that mixture, the simple syrup. Uh, we just try to just kind of just dumb it down, but also be able to make it, you know, to where there's value in it also. Gotcha. Well, what is it about the honey flavor? I keep hearing about that honey flavor. What's one, that's the one in the middle? That's the one Let in the middle. Let me see it. Yeah. The honey flavor. What, what, what about this one that makes it stand up? Um, there's no honey flavored um, vodka on the market that has stood the test of time, but that right there is the product that I created first. I didn't want to just go all the way on the Tito's model, so I went with something that was exclusive to me first, and, uh, and that's that's been the hit. That's our flagship. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we bought out. Um, then we then then I went to the uh, to the unflavor, uh, which is also gluten free and kosher. Uh, and then I went to uh, to cranberry, and now in the uh, spring and the summer we'll be releasing uh, mango and passion fruit. Mm -hmm. And you hooked up with the NBA too, right? And the 76ers? Yes, 76ers. Okay. Uh, I've done multiple uh, spots with the 76ers. Okay. Uh, it looks like uh, via Aramark we'll be programming in Wells Fargo Center, uh, coming for the next season that'll be coming, mm -hmm. which will be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, relationships, mm -hmm. you know, doing good in the community. Uh, we do a bunch of, uh, just a bunch of stuff. As you mentioned, you were in Allentown. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I sit on every single board, diversity board, um, I just try to just do the best thing that I could possibly do from the community standpoint of it. Now, is it profitable? Oh, yeah. Like I said, you know, it's just like uh, owning your masters and being an independent, you know. Um, so instead of my margins getting chopped out, I own distribution. And uh, as a company, we own distribution not only in Pennsylvania, but we also own distribution in, uh, in New Jersey. So, que so uh, question. So... Why was it so difficult for Diddy then when he had his own tequila and it seemed like he couldn't get distribution, he couldn't do it himself. He was, uh, we seen videos of him going liquor store to liquor store mm -hmm. and it seemed like stores really didn't want the product, right? Because there was no distribution connected to it. Mm -hmm. Why is it so difficult for people to, to get their foot in the door, especially with him? Because you figured like with him, it wouldn't be a problem because he's Diddy. And this was before the, as you said, car crash. Right. Um, so we're legitimately less than 1% of the market, right? Just. Mm -hmm being minorities, right? We're legitimately one right. less than 1% of the market. So uh, again, it's the difference between what baggage you're carrying, right? Versus, okay, here's a story of quality, right? Here's what our lineage is. Here's who our star face is. And that's gotta be the way people get connected. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying, you know, that obviously, you know, that, that people didn't want to be connected to Diddy, but there's the, the Diddy angle and then there's the product you know, angle. It's you and you gotta be able to have that separate. Um I always believe that if you're gonna take the product just because of the fact that I've got a celebrity, how many times are you gonna buy that after the fact? Mm -hmm. You know, proposed quality. It's always about the the you know, the value proposition. Got you. And and you're uh you're you're connected with like Music Fest too? Music Fest, so okay. we we are now, uh, so Music Fest is, uh, we need you to come out there since mm -hmm. you're coming to Allentown. Mm -hmm. um, so we connected with Music Fest roughly about roughly about two, three years ago, mm -hmm. uh, became a small sponsor, uh, blew it out of the water. Uh, the next year, we removed uh, another vodka sponsor that was there, uh, got them out of there, then it was us and Jack Daniels for the main stage. And then this year, uh, we'll, we'll be with a with partner. The um, I, I don't think that we can say exclusive legally, but we are the partner that's programming all of the vodka for North and South Side. Music Fest does 1.3 million people a year. Mm -hmm. wow. um, 
which is which is an excellent opportunity, obviously, to get liquid to lips. How did that help the brand? Um, it, <laughs> <laughs> was was that your question? <laughs> no, that was what? just crazy. <laughs> no. <laughs> Great way to get liquid to lips. We trademarked that. <laughs> Reason being, right? <laughs> For point up there, huh? <laughs> but we trademarked that okay. because that's been our motto. We want to be able to get liquid to lips in order to be able for people. We feel like we can win Absolutely. hands down all the way around by did, doing that. How did that help the brand? Is it just eyeballs? So not only that, but we have tasting opportunities, okay. which is great, which allows people, you know, Music Fest draws people from the 20, 30 uh, countries, you know, uh, and, and nationally. And uh, being able to get those sampling opportunities, being able to get people to actually, you know, not only just the brand side mm -hmm. of it, but also at the same time, understand exactly who we are, be able to get a little bit of the no a little knowledge that actually pushes it forward. But also again, you know, appropriately getting liquid to lips. Mm. You know, it's interesting. I feel like there's so many people getting it right. So many black people getting it right mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the spirit business, but it's usually the people who aren't relying on celebrity. It's, when when look, I think about Uncle Nearest, when I look at what y'all doing, you know what I mean? But but y'all, man, it's, it's real work. And that's where you that, that question that you asked, why is this so hard, mm -hmm. right? Because on the back end, we're the minority, right? We're the super minority. So the people who are the majority, they're controlling this, and they've been controlling this for a very long time. So if someone's going to let you in to their exclusive club, they kind of want to know that you're going to do the work that's right. going to back that up. Mm -hmm. So to your point, you know, saying that the people who are finding success are the people who are actually not taking the celebrity route, uh, black people who are finding success. That's the primary difference. The primary mm -hmm. difference is we're getting in front of these distributors and saying, hey, look, you know, I want you to take my product and here's my capacity. Um, it was difficult for anybody to even give me a, a meeting, you know, I would say before the pandemic. Uh, before the pandemic, we were trying to get into different places. We were obviously owning our distribution in the state of Pennsylvania. But at the same time, nobody wanted to hear us. Um, you know, right after the pandemic, we won our first double goal. You know, during the pandemic or right before the pandemic, we won our first goal. Then we became the largest um, craft distillery to produce hand sanitizer. Um, I mean, we made, you know, we made a, a bulk of money just doing that. I dumped wow. all the money back into the company, but we wow. fed everything from frontline workers with meals. Um, we, uh, we donated tons of hand sanitizers to our local hospitals. Uh, we sold a bunch of hand sanitizers to FedEx, UPS, uh, the post office, uh, Comcast. And like, again, that started getting us media attention. <clears throat> with that media attention, you know, I took it and we ran with it right. and, and, you know, and now we're here at this point. So, and I feel like it's something like the product has to sell itself, right? Like I think, you know, with Ciroc, it was something that people liked. The culture gravitated <coughs> towards it. True. They didn't necessarily gravitate towards De Leon. Right. Casamigos. People liked Casamigos. Mm -hmm. Like like you can just a lot of these things you can just see organically. Like I didn't know who was behind Tito's. I'm just like, this Tito's is everywhere. Everywhere. So clearly people just like it, right? right. So it's like it don't matter what celebrity you are. If people don't like it, they don't like it. So I think True. it also in marketing too, because even with vodka. If you ever go to a bar or a club or, or even in the lobby, a lot of people just say, let me get a vodka cranberry or let me get a vodka Sprite or let me get a vodka thing. So it also plays in the, your relationship with a lot of these businesses and restaurants because you want to make sure when they asking for a vodka cranberry that, that they- yours is there. Yours is the one right. that they That's the for. one. But hence, you, heard, you notice how you went to that? Mm -hmm. Most poor cocktail in the world? Vodka, vodka cranberry. cranberry. Yep. So when you take a vodka, a Mishka vodka cranberry, now you're just adding soda on top. You got to mix it? You got to shake it? No. Okay. It's just no. It's it's clean. It's clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, we appreciate. Hold on. You. you got a partnership with Lehigh Valley Children's Hospital. Yes. How the hell does that work? So well, they're uh, not giving the ch no kids. <laughs> <that. laughs> okay. But but we are. But we are um, basically trading the the sales for cocktails, uh -huh. and it's going back into our local children's hospital. So that's a blessing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, man, how do uh, how do we support Mishka? Um, I mean, look, we, we've got multiple ways. Uh, our website is MishkaPremiumVodka.com. Um, we're still, again, like I said, we, we kind of gave a uh, public offering just to be able to get folks like us involved. Uh, but also at the same time, uh, at Drink Mishka mm -hmm. is, uh, is our handles across social media. So all those things are good ways to be able to kind of plug in and play for us. All right. Well, we appreciate you for joining us. Russell Fletcher. Yes, sir. Founder of Mishka Premium Vodka. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning.
Wake that ass up. Early in the morning. The Breakfast Club.